Well, there have been some signs of compromise emerging over the so-called fiscal cliff. Senior Republicans daring to talk about possible tax increases as a way to reduce America's $16 trillion debt. That would be in defiance of a so-called anti-tax pledge promoted by Grover Norquist, he of poopy head. Joining us at the roundish table, Dr Brendan O'Connor, Associate Professor in American Politics at the United States Study Centre at the University of Sydney. Brendan, welcome. Good to be talking with you. Now, now Grover Norquist, he, he is this strangely, he was, he was described to me recently by Senator Alan Simpson, a senior former Republican head of the Debt Reduction Commission, as being the most powerful man in America. He holds no elected office, and yet he has this sort of hypnotic sway over taxation and Republicans. How do you explain it? Grand Central Station of kind of conservative movement politics, uh, a lobbyist of significant power. He organised these kind of power breakfasts on a Monday morning in Washington, where all the conservatives of Washington would get together, there'd be a speaker, the talking points of the week would be worked through, and this gave him enormous kind of sway because people wanted to be on Grover's list. He was involved with the contract with America in 1994 with Newt Gingrich, who was one of the co-authors. And this, I suppose, puts this idea of a pledge forward, that you sign on the dotted line to a contract, the voters know where you are, you're a solid person because of it. And this is what's happened with these tax pledges. And this was all in, in the wake of George H.W. Bush's famous Read My Lips, No New Taxes in the 1988 campaign, a pledge that he broke once he was elected President of the United States. And at that point, conservatives said, mm. you can never, ever increase taxes overall. And most Republicans have signed up to it. Indeed. I mean, it runs against that political sort of maximum that it's events that you've got to be worried about when you're in government and when elections can't predict the future. This type of pledge, you know, is, is very restricting. It's kind of tax fundamentalism to some extent. And I think some of the Republicans realising, well, that Obama can push them to the edge of the cliff on the Bush tax cuts expiring, that really the hand is stacked in Obama's favour on taxes. Maybe not on spending, but on taxes. So compromise is probably sensible from a Republican point of view, more than a Democratic point of view, I would have thought. When we're talking about the Republicans who have come out, like, let's have a look at these Republicans. Three of them are senators, and the Senate doesn't matter at all because it's controlled by Democrats. So they're not, they're not an issue. The issue is the House. The, there has been one House Republican who's come out against the pledge, who's been slapped down since. 93% of them have signed on to the pledge. I'm not sure that there's necessarily going to be that much movement. Or at least we haven't seen signs so far. But what I was going to say is just to, just to, to take up what Brendan was just, just saying. He certainly has been... All these things Brendan said was totally true about Grover Norquist. But I can't help thinking that it's not like Grover Norquist is the Avengers with superpowers. <laughs> you know, Grover Nor Norquist is just a dude who just tells Republicans... I mean, basically allows the Republicans to enforce what they already believe in. Republicans believe in low taxes. And yeah, they're, they're, we all know that they take a lot of money from rich guys who don't want, low, who don't want high taxes. And whether Grover Norquist has a pledge or not, they're never going to vote for tax increases because they don't like tax increases. It's as simple as that. What about that? I mean, it, it is John McCain, uh, Saxby Chambliss, uh, Senator Lindsey Graham, uh, are, they, are they influential or are they just three senators who are in the minority in the Senate anyhow? Are, are they going to give House Republicans a way of breaking the pledge or, or fudging the fact that they're breaking it in, in some other way? I think this has got to be Obama's game. He's got to try to get Boehner to come to a compromise, break with some of the Tea Party people. I mean, that, that's got to be his great hope, that he can create some kind of schism in the Republican Party over this issue and use that for quite a considerable part of this, this next two years. So, I mean, if there is ever an opportunity for a kind of a split off of some of these Republicans, it's in the next month. Beyond that, then I think it probably gets a bit nastier if there's a delay in this decision, if there's another extension of those tax cuts. I would have thought tactically that plays out worse for Obama. So, you know, compromise in Washington hasn't occurred much in the last four years, but I think there is, there is a moment of opportunity, I would have thought. What, what is on the table at the moment? Because uh, we're hearing about, uh, you know, Obama's already said that he's going to let the Bush era tax cuts for those on over $250,000 a year expire at the end of the year. That, that is something that he says is a bottom line thing. Uh, social security is off the table. They're not going to take money out of social security. But things like food stamps and, uh, and, and subsidies to farms as well, they're saying, yeah, some of those entitlements we may haggle over. Who's got the upper hand and what, is, what, what do you think is realistically going to be on that table or is, you know, is this actually just going to get pushed down the road six months and we're, we're not going to see this cliff at all? 
Yeah, that push down the road would be terrible, I think. It would create more uncertainty, no resolution, and there's less sort of reason to compromise once you've got new congresspersons in uh, in the next few weeks. So you want to get a few lame duck people that are going to leave <laughs> to make decisions yeah, in their last watch. Um, I would have thought Obama can say all he really wants about wanting to keep the Bush uh, era sort of uh, tax cuts for the rich, um, you know, moved down, well, moved up rather from 35% to 39.6%. Mm. But he can't achieve that. He's not a legislator. I mean, he can put that on the table. Legislation has to occur through the Congress, through the House. So I would have thought that's, his, that's the Democrats' sort of bidding position to start with. But the Republicans need to, will need to agree to it. Um, so I think Obama is, it would want to push them to the edge of the cliff on the tax cuts. The Democrats on the spending issues, I think, are going to be nervous because they're going to think, well, people are really going to suffer if some of those food stamp cuts and the like that the Republicans are probably more comfortable with come into play. I think the point that Brendan's making about it being Obama's cause, I think, is absolutely true because the bottom line is, as Brendan says, if Obama just does nothing, just says, I'm doing nothing, the taxes, the taxes go up. Yeah. And then he's in a position where he's going, I want to cut people's taxes in a month's time. Yeah. I want to cut the middle class people's taxes. Who's going to stop me? Mm. And so, yeah, and so right now he, the, the time is working in his favour. If he does nothing, he can mm. say mm. either agree to some sensible tax provisions or mm. the taxes are going up and then I'm going to be the tax cutter mm. in six months' time or two months' time or three mm. months' time. So I think you're right in that respect. Yeah. He I mean, the argument that. against that is the Republicans will say, OK, you've won on that one, mm. so we're going to win on cutting entitlements and we're going to say, look... Those mm. food stamp increases that have occurred mm. through the recession, we don't like those so much, or the mm. extensions of unemployment. So they can play hardball yeah. on some of the entitlement expenditure mm. and say, look, this is tit for tat, mm. and uh, you know, you agree with us on these issues or we won't play Especially with Especially given part of the fiscal cliff is unemployment rate, unemployment payments being cut. Yeah. Mm. So that is a we're, mm. we're nearly out of time, but can I get your sense on the, the other push at the moment amongst Democrats is to, to reform the so-called filibuster, uh, in the Senate, so that you, you don't need 60 uh, votes, you can, with a simple majority of 51, you can you can pass uh, legislation. Uh, and democracy, and, exactly. <laughs> now, now you know, Mitch McConnell is saying, "Well, do you really want to do this, guys? Do you really think you're going to be in the majority the whole time? Do Democrats actually want to reform the filibuster, given that inevitably, as the political cycle turns, uh, you know, that they could be at the, the wrong end of it sometime soon?" I think for the process to work much better, it would be a very good idea. I mean, of course, the Democrats are not always going to be in the majority, so they'd have to realise that. But I think for the process of American sort of legislative democracy to work sensibly, it would be a tremendous idea. The filibuster creates this nonsense of needing a supermajority. It hinders the party that has a dominance in both the executive and the legislature from doing things that you could do in a parliamentary democracy very easily. So I, I think it's a tremendously sort of sensible idea. Um, but one that probably will fail at some point. <laughs> well, Brendan O'Connor, thanks very much for coming in today and throughout the year. We'll see you next year. Yeah, great to be on your show. All right. And that's